Oh good, just Nike above. Bye bye. Do you need to check out what we turn around now? Because I was like facing that way. Are we good? All good. Yeah? All good. You trust it? I trust it. <laughs> Episode 60. 60? Six, zero. Amazing. There you go, yeah. yeah. With yeah. Senator Lynn Rowan with us today. Every time I say Senator, I think I like return the Jedi and everyone like fighting with bleeding <laughs> lifesavers. You know what I mean? Sit the Senator. <laughs> yeah. Oh, gosh, I don't mind me. <laughs> <laughs> so I read your book really identified with your book got the whole teenage angst of insecurity and over little tiny details which are massive at the time you know um, great book recommend anyone to uh, buy Lynn's book um, you grew up in Tala mm. and you go in I'm not going to ruin your book you go into a lot in, in Tala Um quick not quick but a summary of growing up with your 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 friends um with the struggles mm. when you look back now bollocks when you look back now ah, there we go yeah don't play again but when you look back now on it if you could transport yourself back what would you say to that 17 year old Wow, I think, I, I, even at 17, it's probably a bit old to say anything to me. I think I was starting to already have the cogs torn in about what I needed to do at that stage. Like, right. you know, I think my life even, like, I think, like, I've been in therapy years. It's something that I've always engaged in at different stages of my life. And Tommy Deegan, a counsellor of mine, um, said to me one time, uh, the, you can, like, you can regret or go back and try and change the stuff or go back or s and say stuff to yourself, but ultimately the decisions you made at each and every point you're done with the resources and tools and mm. how your brain worked at that particular time yeah and if anything then it was that little girl at each and every point that got you to the next step which ultimately got you here yeah so i done a lot of work i suppose i'm not trying to go back and say anything to myself or right. you know it's more it was more about acceptance for i suppose um the life that I've lived um, and then also trying to um, thank that young teenager but then also acknowledge that that young teenager caused havoc and then having to make amends for those things mm. do you know what I mean so there's one thing in accepting all the things that ha happened or that I done as a kid and the, t the way I thought about the world and how intensely I thought about the world and Ultimately, could I have changed that as a child? I'm not really sure I could. Like, I still mm. think about the world intensely. I just yeah, do yeah. it in a different, a different way. Yeah. yeah. Now yeah. I get that. I get that. Like, looking back at me own and just talking about that, it's like, I wouldn't be here with you and I wouldn't be doing this stuff if everything was rosy. Yeah. I had to overcome. Now, there were huge walls to me, but when I look back, I go, I was fuck all, really. <laughs> but at the time... Yeah. Were, yeah, poor me. Yeah, they're fuck off for a grown man. <laughs> yeah, you know? Me. But it's like kids are put kids are in situations that adults might be able to deal with. Hmm. So it's like the situations or how um young people have had to resource themselves or uh, try and survive, they're not usual situations for twelve, thirteen and fourteen year olds. So yeah. they are big walls. Yeah. They're massive. Yeah. yeah. And also in your book, you know, and I do get this, but I, I'm a boy, so like, like I'm a man now but I'm still a bleeding boy but I the, the dangerous situations that we put ourselves in at that age some mm. people with, with that way like I could never see danger you touched on that mm. as well in your book about, about working class people like friends of mine I remember like what are we doing oh there's a bleeding burnt out scrambler there what are we going to do well we're going to put it up on a wall and try and jump off it blind we just, <laughs> or, what, what are we doing on that uh, the, the bonfire is about halfway high so we've a little board and a ramp and we're going to jump through it it's why why Whereas, then in, in, in when you go to other areas people are, are like where people are well put together like by parents and stuff it's like what? Jesus, no, he's <laughs> not doing that. Why do you think, why is that? I don't know, but like even look, even when you talk about things, I'm yeah. like, 
oh my god I want to go over a fucking scrambler on a, <laughs> on a scrambler on a walk I'm going to steal a dice <laughs> so it's like that. you only even have to you only even have to listen to a working class people reminisce about their teenage years yeah. They had good crack. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. And it was dangerous crack, but it, yeah. <laughs> it was like it, we think fondly even of the risk taken yeah. in, in a strange sense. It gets us giddy. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But I think at the time, I think I think our ability to assess risk is very different. And on a philosophical level, I try and strip that back to the value and worth we place on our lives or being able to see forward to the future. So there was never any real next step in your life as a teenager. Mm. So you weren't thinking about, well, I can't do that because I have to study for my Leave It Cert exams because I want to be an engineer. So there was mm. never any point. We, we weren't anchoring ourselves to any points in the future mm. that were hugely significant, mm. which mm. makes me wonder if so many of us really didn't, we were so risk adverse and we didn't assess risk in terms of our own lives because we didn't really we didn't really anchor to any other parts of our lives apart from that one moment in that time yeah. and the escapism that that brought that brought and the laughter that those risky situations also brought yeah but then there would be kids in your own community that could assess risk so it's not even that it was other types of commu- like i would have friends that would go <laughs> what the fuck are you doing that for yeah, yeah, you yeah. know so like yeah. i have there's loads of parts of my makeup and character that made me very risky in my behavior very um impulsive yeah. you know um and all that stuff could could be or may not be because of my environment but i do think it was very heavily influenced by my environment you know mm-hmm. now that you're saying that my ma is it says why can't you be like Rona brazil up the road he's never in any plain trouble you always had the guards at the door of one of the neighbors yeah. the, or did yeah. you have one of them why yeah. can't you be like your woman up the road yeah. Or even like my brother. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, That's like funny. my brother brought no trouble yeah. to the house. Mm. My parents worked very hard. My dad was my dad was a, a presser, a machinist. He was a referee and played League of Ireland football and taught us massive sportsmanship. And um, you know, and my brother played played ball. Was dedicated to that. And um, like, so I was the only one bringing mm. like absolute chaos into mm. the house. Like my house was quite a yeah. a settled house and yeah. I was lucky in comparison because so many people had the chaos in the community with their peers and then also within their home I always had a safe space to return to which yeah, was yeah. Ob- which was probably what helped me step back into a space of you know being able to make better decisions because yeah. that was that structure was there like, yeah yeah. Mm. now it's, it's like with looking back like the, reading your book you're kind of similar to me I chased that bit of chaos, but maybe, looking back on it, maybe if there was other avenues like MMA and Jiu-Jitsu, but I kind of lacked that structure mm. to attend all the time, but I always liked to still do. Love a bit of madness. Mm. <laughs> I jo- I was, as a, a kid, madness. like, I giant everything. Mm-hmm. I giant everything and stayed in nothing. Yeah. And yeah. I giant, and I was good, like, I, I'm back playing ball on the last few weeks and I run and so I've always like it stood to me in that sense yeah. joining and everything I was always engaged in fitness at some level and but as a kid like I took you know like, looking now like you know I'd say if I had s- assessments there, there would probably be some maybe ADHD there or there's mm. different things that just weren't you didn't go and get assessed for any of that when you were younger yeah. do you know what I mean so you take the environment being chaotic me probably also having PTSD I would imagine after Jenny was hit by the bus yes. and I used to get flashbacks and so there was lots of mental health stuff happening mm. for me that wouldn't have been picked up at that time do you know yeah. what I mean like um, there wouldn't have been oh god maybe we should you know get some sort of assessment to see if Lynn needs you know there was just like Lynn needs support keep her in the house make sure she has her dinner fill her bath for all practical stuff yeah. But that not necessarily like unraveling what was going on mm. in in my head, like do you know what I mean? Yeah. But um, I think, like I think engaging in sports is one thing, and I think it, it is a way out and a way for people to funnel and channel their energy in so many ways. But then there will be still always people that even struggle in that sense yeah. because there's so much trauma going around in their head. So it's yeah. like there's, I think there's a scale, I suppose, of you know who can engage, who will engage. And then the forest to reach young men, especially the forest to reach young men, 
that you can try and engage and try and engage but they're just so disheartened and disengaged you know and I think they're giving up on so much like yeah. nobody represents them or wants to talk about them or yeah. you know they, they, they're the ones that will be labelled they're the ones that will end up in and out of prison and it's like it's like they were once the children that people were saying they're vulnerable we need to give them lots of support and then they hit a certain age and they act out and they're like don't want nothing to do with them and it's really it's it's it, yeah like it's not it's not good like you know but you, you talk about the ADHD there we, we recently had to a couple of years ago do something with a diagnosis like that I remember it, it's amazing because first of all we went to the HSE and we went through the rigmarole there and it's like this isn't happening quick enough we kind of need this and we went privately mm. and we spent the money privately and when you're spending the readies privately the wheels turn real quick and anyway we got the diagnosis and whatever and I remember like reading out the diagnosis kind of going yeah <laughs> See, that, but that's, what, that's, that's why like, I'm saying ADHD because yeah. that's what happened to me I was like yeah yeah I was yeah. like who's this questionnaire <laughs> for <laughs> every time my wife goes I'd be like sorry it's me ADHD like, I'm running her pants and I'm like will you shut the fuck up and I'm like sorry it's me ADHD <laughs> I just can't help myself yeah. but, but I'm reading that and, and then anyway we got it privately and about about a month ago, my wife got a phone call from the HSE. Three years later now, and goes for an appointment. For an appointment. Three fucking years. Yeah. Now we went privately. Yeah. It's like ah oh, no, we don't yeah. need that. So what is happening with the young one yeah. up in Tallah, who's yeah. no real income coming in, yeah. or no, or on her own, two three boys, you yeah. know. What's happening here? Mm. You know, absolutely nothing, and that's the thing. So they're the kids that will, they're the kids that will will have needed, or the families that would have needed support, Stop needed care, time. needed, um, in some cases, educational assessments to see how they learn in school, what will work best for them, and then there are also the families that will be living um, the closest to the poverty line, and then there are also the families that will be living in communities that maybe have you know a bit of chaos going on or different yeah. you know so it's like there's disadvantage within disadvantage within disadvantage so yeah. sometimes you know and people are starting to play around with language now going oh we don't like calling communities disadvantaged or people disadvantaged and i kind of get a little bit like what, what the fuck, the fuck do you want us to call it like yeah, so yeah. I, like don't water down yeah. people's experiences either and don't water down the fact that there's communities that are, have a huge level of disadvantage but now it's not only disadvantage because of say um, low income it's disadvantage in terms of access to information it's disadvantage in terms of access to health care it's mm-hmm. it, so you're just there it's 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 a whole multitude of disadvantages mm-hmm. you know and once you don't access like if you have a group of friends and you, you know the kids the kid is acting out in school or can't concentrate or whatever it may be and you say to your friend in the morning time maybe you know walking back from the school saying i was thinking of going and getting little johnny a uh, fucking assessment like i think he might need a bit of support in school or might need extra extra you know an sna or and then in that space of you with your friends your friends are saying to you there's no point yeah, i'm yeah. on that i'm on that list two years yeah, yeah. i haven't got called yet yeah. so what happens is then you've people within the same group who never have their rights recognized never have uh their the never get to access health in the way um that that people with money do and i've experienced that as well because i'm in a position now where i've lived with having to rely on waiting lists and now i also am in the other space where i can afford grinds for my children mm. i can afford to go private for yeah. healthcare assessments yeah do you know what i mean yeah, and so yeah. i've i've I, I can observe yeah how the world moves mm. in both of them spaces yeah and the capital and it's beyond financial so it's social and cultural yeah. i know right now if one of my children came up against a particular issue i could now ring someone directly yeah years ago i would have going who could I write a letter to and maybe if I write a letter to that person that person might advocate over in that space and now I'm just like and now I'll just go straight in yeah. and like that's a fucking yeah. that was it that blew my mind like, yeah, you yeah. know and that social and cultural capital of just knowing people having access and people you know being able to actually ask direct questions to the people who can answer them yeah. instead of going through 90 million people to yeah. try and get an answer on a thing 
that you needed an answer on two years ago so that your child didn't fall through the cracks yeah yeah now i I spoke with another friend of mine about this and his, his dad died of cancer and i had him on the podcast and he said, my dad didn't really die of cancer. He died of poverty because <laughs> mm. he was in that scenario mm. just bumbling around yeah. and you're in a public health system where you're getting appointments which are months and months and months off which could have been sorted fairly mm. quickly. Not a very aggressive type cancer mm. but just left ignored. Whereas there's my dad who got p- private health insurance via his job which covers me ma and how can he, he's ain't wrong with him and he's straight in mm. and do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it there is a two tier system. It, yeah, it's 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 and it's it, it's all around health equity as well. So it's like, you know, a friend of mine runs a, a health equity um, not for profit which provides health care to like homeless community, migrant community, um, in the traveling community as well. And she always uses a phrase that I always go back to when thinking about things and and that's that, and um, those who need health care the most are the least likely. Yeah. to receive it yeah. so those who are the sickest those yeah. who are the furthest at the back of the line yeah. you know there'll always be people that experience poverty but maybe have the know-how to engage in something but there's people like there's a whole there's thousands of people that are just so far at the back of the line at the back yeah. of the queue they never even get to the extra supports that something someone might introduce you know that's particularly targeted at a particular community yeah. you know what I mean yeah. so yeah and even when, when Yvonne was having the kids, we were in private. So we had the kids. And this is just, I'm all aware of this, you know what mm. I mean? And I'm looking at it from the other point of view. So we're paying this bloke, whatever, three and a half grand. But this bloke works public As well. and yeah. private. He's an office in the same place. So it's like you being a senator, right, for 10 hours a week. And then going, how are you going? Uh, Lynn Ruan roofing here. Using the same phone and the whole lot. Oh, yeah, you want the real phone, that joke? Yeah, no bother. And this is all being paid for. And then you're working privately. Yeah. It's it's mad set up. Yeah. yeah. Mad no, it, set like, up. That's why we, like, we, like, th- there needs to be no two-tier health yeah. system. It needs to be one tier and you need to remove um, the difficulties of access for people into the healthcare system. Like, it just, you shouldn't be profiting in, in that way um, privately exactly when you're also running public um, mm. administration and else, elsewhere and to be able to even as a doctor look and go like the, when you're with a private patient watching as an individual doctor watching going I can see how quick I'm dealing with that pe- people that person but I have a waiting list of a hundred people here so as a doctor that can't sit right with you yeah. that you can see the access that somebody mm. can get privately and not and that, thankfully there's lots of gps that do speak out about yeah. the, the inequality in the health system yeah. but yeah like the two-tier system is just another tool of discrimination and filtering people into um who deserves good health care and who doesn't deserve good health care mm-hmm. but and the thing is when you do like we've had experience in the public health system especially in relation to to, to mental health and um and my daughter were Asperger's when you get into the system when you finally get in it can work quite well yeah, yeah. but it's the point of getting in and how many people you lose yeah. before they get in yeah. do you know what I mean and that's yeah. the that's, that's obviously your big issue and I, I, I we found you know just getting the paperwork all we need is the paperwork to get the SNAs and the stuff it's not like somebody's going oh, we're here we're going to yeah. save you now yeah. it's like yeah you have your paperwork so you can get this get yeah. that and that's yeah. that's really it's just a stamp yeah. To be able to go, yeah. no, we need that because yeah. here we go. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Rather than okay, like ten doctors waiting for you. Yeah. Right, we're gonna help. Yeah. No one's coming to help. Yeah. It's it's yeah. all it's yeah. an inside yeah. job. Like you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And and yeah. I, I suppose with with the the bit of a diagnosis, we've just learned to just step back a bit and yeah. just chill a bit. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and walk better. You know? Yeah, and I think that's one of the biggest things that I've found about. Um, diagnosis whether it be um, so I do a lot of work with as I am and, and um, work with, with kids that are on the autistic spectrum and then I would have it within my own household and um, the biggest thing as a mother was learning how to respond differently because mm. I was at making my daughter worse yeah, when yeah. I was growing up I was yeah. actually like what are you doing in bed rah, rah, rah. Yeah, like yeah. I was actually adding yeah. the pressure and stress and and 
So a diagnosis can be hugely empowering and yeah. helpful for a family. Do yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. And then you hear people going, oh, you don't need labels, you don't need sense. So like, unfortunately, some people do need to understand yeah. um, what it is about their thought process, how they engage with the world, how they see with the world, if they have sensory issues. All that stuff is so important to be yeah. able to get through life. But it's also so important for the people around them mm. to be able to also adapt and learn. I'm a better person yeah. now. Like I shout less. Like if anyone's seen how much I shouted <laughs> yeah. Yeah. as a teenage yeah. mother at yeah. my poor daughter who had yeah. turned out had sensory issues all along, <laughs> so you can imagine what, was, what that was like for her. Yeah. You know, it was horrific and mm. traumatic. Mm. You know, but I've learned to be much. I I I I I've, I've been able to learn how to take a step back and engage differently. I suppose yeah. with her, but with other people in general. Yeah. You know. Now I. I like the way I parented me for Sean Flat is different than the way it's like, get your fucking breakfast in yet? Where's your fucking coat? <laughs> Out, get in that van. I'm not gonna be bleeding like blah blah blah. The now, first the other, pancake. now the other the fella first is pancake like, is yeah, always it's, fucked. It's cool, you <laughs> forgot your shoes. You don't know where your coat is, it's cool. Well, yeah, <laughs> my <laughs> eldest daughter does be fuming going if you if you any idea what I took for you to just be able to walk around carefree and here's yeah. Jalen yeah, <laughs> yeah. doesn't give a shit yeah. <laughs> and I think I think we grow like I'm delighted because you do so much more work on yourself totally you know yeah. what I mean so it's like yeah. now this other stuff which society tells me is super important and really important and achieve mm-hmm. and to be a good person you need to nah we need to look at roots kind of around that you know what yeah, I mean as yeah. as as parents yeah. and as what we yeah. want for him and whatever you know what I mean mm. so I people go oh Jesus I man, I'm delighted <laughs> fucking delighted yeah. so I've ch- it may yeah. changed me as a person yeah. changed yeah. me no, as a I've person learned, you know? I've learned so much from my daughter daughters in terms yeah. of and I think when you can get past that idea that you know, adults know better, our parents know best. Like that's just yeah. so not true in so yeah. many cases, you know. Yeah. And I think that the, what I've learned from them has one hundred percent made me a better person. Mm. Like you know, yeah, I'd hundred yeah. percent agree with yeah. that. You know, hundred yeah. percent. But um, also we talk about want to talk about your community, especially yeah. in Tallet, and I'm aware of Paddy's gym and all the other yeah. gyms up there. So many from Tallet. If MMA was in the Olympics, in the next next Olympics, in the Tala area alone, I could say if, if the few good young ones and young, good young ones that are coming up from the Jobstown area and from your area, there's like four medals, mm. four Olympic medals. Like young Nate as well. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like he's amazing. No, no, you have um, the dedication and the work that that young yeah. lad. Because I do, I would share some. His mother would, um, I would have played football with her many, many years ago. So yeah. she comes up, and I do see the work that that, and I'd be like, yeah. he can go, he could, he could go so far with this. Yeah. Now there's 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 so many kids in that area, girls and boys, that could be Olympic medalists, mm. but just aren't. Sport Ireland won't recognise MMA. It's a bit of a all boys network mm. kind of with regard to that, but um, it's it's. It's in all our communities, and kind of it's it's it just. I suppose it needs more politicians with eyes on it to go. Why why is this? You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Because you know, in in your area or in middle class areas, working class areas, any areas, sport. Yeah, it'll help seventy percent of people don't have mm-hmm. to fight. Eighty percent they just want to train, but for the ones that want to go on, it's it's great opportunity mm-hmm. for them. You know, mm-hmm. not everyone's going to go to college. Now everyone's going to be a doctor. Not everyone's, but other people have. Yeah, totally. These areas and these kids need different routes. Yeah. No, no. I think, um, like, I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't have a huge understanding, yeah. I suppose, or insight into Sport Ireland or their decision making, yeah, yeah. or I've never had to look at it before. But one area, mm. I suppose, that I have looked at is the lack of investment in the likes of boxing, yes. which is obviously, it's not, it's obviously, it's not the same as mixed martial arts, but yeah. I mean, it's on the same tread. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I've always kind of observed that yeah. as being, you know, is the lack of investment in that at a community level because it is primarily a working class sport, mm. you know. Mm. And like if you look at 
you know, like if you look at for years even how rugby and concussion and head injuries and it's kind of like, well, like, you know, there's also like in other contact sports yeah. and there's also the idea of violence. It's just not called violence, but how they actually throw each other around the pitch and yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, yeah. It, 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 it can still be similar, you know, so I yeah. don't. I don't really know or understand why they don't invest. Um, I would hate to think it's another class issue and not investing in a sport that is very heavily um, attended by so many young men in yeah. working class areas, mm. you know. Mm. But the investment that goes into it from a coach's perspective, from a young person's perspective, for me, every sport, like f in some areas, sport is people play sport because they they engage they like the sport or they're talented at the sport or they want to get better at the sport. In some of our communities, sport is actually saving lives and it's mm -hmm. the only thing that might save a life. Yeah. And it also, it, you know, it engages people in thinking about their body and thinking about how to connect to their body and thinking about what food to eat. That wouldn't probably ordinarily happen in many of those young men's lives and young women's lives um, had they not engaged in the likes of MMA or any other sport. Yeah. So investment in sport at a working class level is so much more than sport it's mm. it's so much bigger and it's so much more about even harm reduction right the more someone's in a gym the more someone's on a pitch the more someone's in a cage the less likely they are to be being sucked up by a, a, a community where there's a huge amount of drug taken there's a huge amount of risk in terms of violence all those things and you're taking that and you're putting it into a controlled space mm. so the, the holistic impact that that has on society mm. so it goes beyond the individual and the club mm. and the olympics mm. and it goes into role modeling and it goes into you know the fact that um it will save lives it will uh, reduce crime it will reduce recidivism it will increase people staying in school um, it will actually increase even education going at toward level because people can then start accessing scholarships based on how talented they are at their sport yeah. but they might want to study sports science or physio or something related yeah. so it has just its benefits are endless yes. and it can't be just seen through the sole kind of view of like this is just a sport in a community and you know we're not investing in that or recognising that do you know what mm, I mean mm, no it's, it's I'm a huge believer and I can see I'm involved in it and I go to gyms and I'm looking at and I can see um what would I call them? You wouldn't call them youths that can go either way. Mm. They can go either way. You you're looking at it, you can see, and I've seen a few go the other way and 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 then the ones that are just keep turning up. And yeah, they're never gonna be Olympians, they're never gonna be champions, the whole lot, but like what you said there two hours in the gym and they they, they feel a bit good after it because I know this I can see it so they feel a bit good after it and they're going home and you know after doing two hours Jiu Jitsu wrestling MMA whatever they're not going out to stand on the street corner because they're bollocks mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean yeah. so if they're doing that every night down two hours and then they're not going out in the street mm -hmm. corner and I've known over the years and, and you have as well young fellas that weren't really ringleaders you know what I mean but when they're out in the street corner they just kind of get sucked into it and next of all they're in prison mm. you know what I mean so it's it's harm reduction it's everything yeah. that you just you yeah. spoke about there you yeah. know it's um it needs to be to be great if it was recognised and I suppose bit more and with, money with, put into with it. recognition then becomes a level I suppose of oversight and safety and yes um you know it also you know sportsmanship teaching a young person sportsmanship um especially when it comes to a sport um like boxing or like kickboxing or MMA or any of those where you know you're, it's literally ingrained in you and taught to you that. You, you don't use your sport outside of that space. You don't use your sport on a normal person yeah, yeah. that has not. So you actually, you're actually, it sounds counterintuitive, but people who are engaged in fighting for a sport are literally told to be non violent outside yeah. of that space. So you're actually yeah. reducing the capacity for crime or yeah. violence um, outside of that space yeah. if you teach good sportsmanship to people yeah. that they don't ever use yeah. their skill or their talent outside of the ring. 
Yeah. That means they're concentrating it to that space and that space only. Do you know yeah. what I mean? And when you come to a lot of communities where you have a lot of volatile young men, violence can be something that is very prevalent in, in a person's day. Yeah. And if you're taking that and going, you take that out of that unsafe space, unregulated space, unskillful space, dangerous space, and you put it into a space like a boxing ring or like the cage, and yeah, like there's just a potential for things to be just much safer. And yeah. you know, and that's what regulation can bring. When you and keep something unregulated, you're actually keeping it, you're pushing it into an unsafe space. Yeah. And when you have a guy that's a really trained martial artist or a trained boxer with years behind them and somebody's giving him a bit of shit out on the street, he's looking at that person that's giving him a bit of shit going, this is like an Alsatian going at a chihuahua. There's no point. Just mm. walk off there, mate. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's it's yeah. so unfair that the other person is not going to engage. It's like yeah, whatever, yeah. walk away. You know, ninety five percent of yeah. the time. Yeah. You know, ninety five percent. So now I I, yeah. I do agree with what you said there. You know, and I heard mm. and you, you brought up it was uh, Terence Wheelock. Yeah, and the, I came across the Wheelocks about ten years ago. They had a bit of a protest about ten years ago on O'Connell Bridge. That's how long this has gone on, years and years and years. So mm. I, 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 I know the case, um, and I'm not talking about that particular case, but the police, m my experience of just pre-COVID at the moment, you know, and I'm never in trouble with the police, but they're heavily, like, and I know, I'm not, this is not critical of the police, of, of family members, of cousins, everything in the guards, but there is areas of, like, driving through a checkpoint in Blanchestown and there's two people standing on the side of the road with submachine guns. What's that all about? You know what I mean? I'm driving up by what what's that all about? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. What's like, that all about for the young fellas in that area? These are tilled up to bits like yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. Community police well, and what what it does is it creates the it creates the the it creates the idea that um the the estates in which those in right so like sometimes I get probably too philosophical about how I try and think about things. So if you arrive in an estate um, and you're armed police, mm. right? People don't um, just submit. They try and match that. Yes. So they try like because, you know, because you're telling that people in that estate or on that road or in that community, right? That you need guns to engage with them. Yeah. Right. So straight away you go, you create from that second, that moment you walk into that estate armed, you create a scenario where you don't trust us, you think you have to stand in our estate with a gun, so yeah. uh, what is that? what are you saying about us? Yeah. So then there's never any room for a positive engagement yeah. if that's how you arrive in a space. You only have to go back even, like, because when, when I speak, obviously, I, I, I have less engagement with the guards now and... Um, than I did when I was growing up but even mm. like at the point of raiding a house like have you ever seen how guards raid a house yeah. mm. and it could be for like a really really low level heroin addict that's after being selling yeah. a little bit like I mean it's not that they're raiding for some big international no, trafficking no. crime yeah. right it yeah. could be really low level stuff yeah. and the way they come into a house and a woman say that has never had to experience the guards like that and the way they overturn the whole house like they're looking for some sort of murder weapon when yeah. they're not mm. right and how they speak to people when they walk in how they order them about the there's actually no need for that yeah. most women in working class estates if the guards come to say they're going they, they, they're going to raid the house they'll cooperate but they yeah. don't they go in and treat everyone in the house mm. like they're criminals yeah. and pull the house apart and show no respect for the people that are in there yeah. you know so then you don't even only create a negative situation between the person who is involved in criminality and, and the guards who are there to police criminality, but you create an environment where everybody in that household now that also now don't trust you because you've just treated them like a piece of shit yeah. in their own home and the way you've spoke to them. And it, just, it, does, it does nothing in terms of policing. Yeah. If you can't negotiate or speak to people, it does nothing. In, like we were speaking about MMA and violence like i mean there's there's like historically structurally the, the the guards have been violent and there's so many instances and cases of a needless violence mm. you know and you know, it's 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 like how can it, it's like how can you 
how can it be okay for a group of people to put on a uniform and then be extremely violent in 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 some cases to people but if you were a young man in a, an mma cage it's barbaric or if you're a young man in a nike tracksuit in jobstown and you and you engage in the same thing but somehow that level of violence is legitimized by putting on a uniform mm. Mm. right yeah. and violence is violence regardless of what you're wearing yeah yeah right yeah. and if you're using your power or authority to use violence when it is not in any way necessary or has nothing got to do with the situation that you're in you are just a violent person it doesn't matter where, whether you're wearing a blue uniform or a nike tracksuit you're still engaging in the same negative behavior mm. as anybody else do you yeah. know what i mean and yeah. i that's what i don't understand how violence can become something else yeah. just because of who's actually administering it yeah. yeah you know and and they're the questions we need to ask yeah. because like of course we're always going to have policing in ireland right it's not that like there's no point going oh like well for me there's no point me going you know get rid of the police da, no, da, 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 no, da. No. so for me it's about going how do we engage and stand up and people share their experiences about their experiences with the guards and there's so many different fractions of the guards in the training unit and stuff we've had stuff on the mental health committee and um in relation to guards responding to somebody that say is in the psychosis or and um, is on the spectrum yeah. or anything like that and it's about how policing has to change in those scenarios because police often come in and make the scenario worse yeah. with how abrupt they are or you know just their training how regimented they are and you're dealing with somebody who's having a mental health episode yeah. And you actually create a crime yeah, because yeah. you're creating a, a, a scuffle <laughs> then between people that didn't really need to happen. Yeah. So there is a huge, like, kind of, there's a huge section of people that in the guards that are trying to work internally to have guards properly trained and yeah. trained on, like, trained in trauma as well. And which is so important because when you go into a community and police a community that is heavily traumatized, the guards historically have actually become part of reinforcing that trauma. Yeah. Like my first experience of real violence was from authority figures. Yeah. Like so people would view or have this kind of lens on some of our communities that they are inherently violent or something, yeah. which they're not. Yeah. It was actually state structures yeah. that came in and introduced me to my first level yeah. of violence. Mm. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't yeah. us teaching each other violence. It was yeah. actually the, 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 the state and the structures and you know violence as well is not always something physical violence is you, you can make violent decisions you can make violent policy yeah. you know violence is also structural mm. you know and it's about being able to discuss violence without feeling like you're going to be shut down because the guards then provide other roles in society that people see as positive but yet there's hundreds of people in the black community in the traveler community in the working class community who are having a very different experience and it's not okay to not listen and give space to those experiences yeah. because it's not just like it wouldn't be okay for a guard to punch the head off some young man in Dublin 6 yeah. it's equally not as okay to do it in a working class community yeah. but it goes unseen in working class communities yeah. because there's this general feel that well what did you do yeah 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 you must have done something to deserve it yeah. and over the years we internalize that yeah so for years I never spoke about guard of violence because I think I had internally told myself that that's, that's yeah, like, that's the relationship. Yeah. The relationship between me as a teenager and a guard is a violent one. Yeah. So why would you speak about that? Because that's what it is. Yeah. And that just shouldn't be the case, you know? A friend of mine shared a video there a while ago, Paddy Hewlihan. It was a, a guard interacting with a young fella up in Tala. Now, when you see 15 seconds of a video, mm. it's... But all I seen was a young fella on the bike, the guard coming over, booting him off the bike, being super aggressive to him, right? That so that was one. Mm. Then there was that other uh, black young fella up in Branchestown, George mm. Ninchenko, who was shot six times, mm. six bleeding times. Now, then I look at the internet. I didn't comment on any of them. Didn't say anything. And I'm looking at the internet, going, like what you said. Oh yeah, but what did he do? It's like he was shot six bleeding times. He had a knife. They were engaging with him. He was obviously having some type of mental health episode mm. or whatever. But if you have to shoot a bloke six bleeding times, six times, yeah. like, what? All training, everything has failed. Mm. He's there in the garden. Mm. You're here. 
You know what I mean? He's, he hasn't got you around the trout or anything. Yeah. yeah, it does. That's barbaric. But then the internet is, oh yeah, but he had a knife. Yeah. It's like the internet wants to go, yeah, I'm right, you're wrong. Yeah, I tend to stay away from no, all no. that, thankfully. <laughs> I've learned over the years to not engage in that because it's such an insular space, the internet and how they talk but about it. But for me, like, it's the lack of training. Yeah. Somebody yeah. had to shoot him six times. Yeah. Six times. Yeah. Okay, worse comes to worse. He grabs someone and tries to knife them in the leg, drop them, whatever. Yeah. Six times. Yeah. In this area. Yeah, like, I mean, I, I remember, like, I remember watching, like, when I watched that at the time, I tweeted something really light, really light. Yeah. I just, I said, there had to be another way than what has just happened. Yeah. That's all I said. Yeah. And I got threads of people yeah, yeah. attacking me. And I'm like, so, like, it's all right what? to be dropping people. <laughs> so I'm like, in. I literally said there should be another way. And are all these people saying, no, that, that, no, what yeah, happened there? People. And that is sad for humanity and for Irish society that there's people that can look at a black man being shot by the police and be completely okay with it. Mm. Like, that is, there's something sick about us as a people. If yeah. we can detach ourselves so much from another human life and go no that was completely warranted yeah. because even even when someone does something wrong i can't go no that's completely warranted because i i don't believe that we should be shooting people dead ever yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> for anything yeah yeah <laughs> do you know yeah. what i mean yeah. like and and we we apparently pride ourselves in ireland on this idea of like you know police and by consent and this and that but yet you can see that that's not really true either mm. that that it's not really by consent mm. it might be by consent in a portion of society but there's definitely a huge portion of society for marginalized and minority groups that don't get any say in how mm. they're policed yeah. there's no consent there's no agency there's no engagement and anything it creates an unsafer space in some communities yeah. rather than a safer space yeah. you know as a politician you'll hear a lot like um right even down to scramblers like like the way like you know call the police call the police no there's loads of scramblers in the park and the yeah. football pitch is getting wrecked or whatever they're like call the police call the police you know we'll just the, the community will be safer if you call the police and i'm kind of going that's not that's not true yeah. what might actually <coughs> be safer right now is that is acknowledged that there's a group of young men who absolutely love scramblers isn't that great yeah. that they have an interest now take that interest especially in Talla we live on the foot of the mountain mm. build the best fucking scrambler park that can exist in Talla yeah. teach them how to look after their bikes teach them how to fucking keep safe on the bikes and then you're, you're it's also a great opportunity for youth work yeah. so youth work always needs to find a way to engage with yeah. the hardest to reach people and if yeah. some of the hardest to reach people are rallying scramblers around the place use that yeah. again it's training it's like everyone wants to think oh I don't like that behaviour let's push them out let's erase them instead of going okay I don't really understand the fantasy or the fucking obsession with scramblers but isn't this a great opportunity to, to engage a young person around yeah. something that they care about Yeah. and I think people are really losing all those connections about how to work yeah. with people do yeah. you know what I mean Yeah. now and I, 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 I think also with the advent of the internet out by me it's a new, a lot of dubs have moved into the area, so there's ample amounts, loads of teenagers. So they're going around the gangs, mm. they're going around in, and some of them, it's it's not serious stuff they're up to, but I had to leave a community group, Facebook group, I came off Facebook, because I'm looking at all this fucking, they're going around in a fucking group. Mm. They're not believing attacking people are, and it just seems to be this, in my day, hating teenagers you know just probably because I I support teenagers because I have teenagers but like what you say that ring the police the scramblers they fuck all else to do what mm. do you expect them to do mm. like yeah. if they're playing football you're giving out about them playing football on the field you know what I mean mm. it's it's there's opportunities there to engage with teenagers mm. But we seem to forget that we were teenagers once and we were dickheads once mm. as well. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So it's 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 a it's it's not a no win situation mm. if you're going on like that. Mm. In, they need to be engaged with totally. via the scramblers, via the horses. It's like with the horses the, when the Feathercane Horse Project opened or the Equestrian Centre and Ballyferme. Yeah. It's about acknowledging that there's an interest yeah. which is great. Yeah. And now what do you do with that interest? You try and invest in it. And you create spaces for young people to engage in the interests that they're, you know, like, 
you can't make a kid that loves horses or a kid that loves scramblers like Horlam. Yeah, yeah. You can't just go, oh no, we need to invest much more in, um, uh, you know, football sport or team sport and then you know invite the people the other young it's like no that, that's not what they like they're yeah. telling you they like scramblers so yeah. create something like there's a there's a project in limerick in my ross at the minute where they're looking at building a scrambler park there and i'm just hoping it acts as some sort of a pilot yeah. for others to take we've so much green space in dublin yeah. that we could be we could be doing that but yeah. a lot of the answers that you would hear is ring the police yeah. and it's just like have we not got the ability to think logically and reasonably and creatively to be able to as communities see something that's an issue within our community or that might need a bit of investment and work that out ourselves yeah. why would we need to call the police for everything rather than actually engaging as a community in providing solutions and answers do you know yeah. what i mean yeah now it's it's i because I, I work in that area, I told you I was up in Rossfield during the week and I was walking away. And I'm in Rossfield and two BMWs and a police car come into the area, like, guard the cars. Like, and I'm kind of walking there going, oh, Jesus, you know what I mean? Yeah. So what are the people living in that, that are coming across this all mm. the time? So it's, 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 there's no, that's not community policing, driving a high power vehicle in where, armed response down the side of it or helicopters no that's that's like Gaza type stuff no mm. they're they're like fighting a war against us yeah you know but what that's I mean? what it is it creates that war like mm. um, it creates that war like an, an environment you know and like it's not community policing it's actual proper policing of people mm. and their movements and it's looking for crimes to happen not even being phoned because of like it's like it's looking for crying so like it's like what i've always said in relation to decriminalization of drugs possession is that you know if you don't decriminalize drugs possession we're as a country saying that it's okay to continue to use the law to criminalize young working class people or um young people from minority backgrounds right so we're saying we're okay in this country to have laws that are purely about convicting young working class people mm. like that's it we're happy with that because them same laws ex are supposed to exist across the whole of the state yeah. but yet there's no police on any of the other in the other places to actually see that the same young people or the same 13 year old young fella in a different area is also carrying the same amount of weed as the other young fella in Kulak. Yeah. but the police are constantly stopping and searching stopping and searching stopping and searching this lad mm. in Kulak. yeah and they're not even batting an eyelid when they drive past a young lad with his haversack going into Trinity who spends the rest of the day stoned outside yeah, the path. Yeah. There's yeah. no guard stopping him. No. So they're engaged in the same behaviour. Yeah, yeah air behaviour because we live in a particular community or we speak a certain way or we look a certain way or we have a certain colour skin. Well then what you do is we, we'll arrest them, we'll stop and search them, we'll stop and search them, we'll criminalise them and we'll flush them into the justice system. And then we'll blame everyone else that they haven't been able to succeed in life. But yet we're the ones that over police them and try to find every single little thing that they might have done wrong. Mm. And we'll make sure they have a conviction on their record and they can never engage in, in education or in job or in volunteerism. Because every time they get guard vetted, you'll see that list of times they were stopped for drunken disorderly, for a small amount of possession, for minor theft. And yet there's no police on other streets in communities in Dublin that will find the same, even though the same behaviour is happening. Mm. So it's literally policy being used as a tool to discriminate against social class. And keep people impoverished because they can't get the yeah. job or can't, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Keep them there. Yeah. Mm. No. Yeah. <sighs> no, that's, that's, uh, that's heavy tack, but that's what's going on. Yeah. That's what's going on. And we, we have it on our screens then on Inside the K. If you're unsure, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't watch it. <laughs> if, you, yeah. if you're unsure, if you're unsure and you want to just watch Inside the K and don't watch it from a point of view of going, oh, what RTE wants you to watch it, to look at it like and go, okay, I feel safer now in my nice estate because that's where the scumbags live. Mm. Do you know what I mean? That's what it's all about. Mm. You know what I mean? Oh, and that's who the scumbags are. You know what I mean? You know, and we, 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 we raise state money. So we know who the scumbags are because mm. we can watch them live on our telly. Mm. You know? And it's like it's 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 
you know if you're when we're looking at like documentaries or entertainment style things and um, there's this there's this real detachment then from people that watch that and think that that's who we are and that's how we live our lives mm-hmm. like they're watching it through an entertainment lens yeah. while there's people in their communities like overdosing dealing with massive trauma hanging themselves all of that but it's like then we're sold as entertainment yeah you know and yeah. that's 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 really fucking sad like yeah yeah, yeah. Now, what pisses me off about Inside the K is it focuses on Cabra Fingless Ballymoon, but the Cabra area. My family came from Walla Cabra. Me, me uncle was an Olympian. Me dad, like, they done serious stuff in sport. But now, we're just going to show you lads lashing around on scooters and lashing horses up and down the road mm-hmm. and getting arrested and all that. We're not going to show you any positivity because only fear sells. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or even, the, but even when we show the not so nice stuff, right? So does the positivity, but then there's also sh- showing the outcome of intergenerational poverty and trauma. Mm. So if you're going to talk about people's behaviours, right? Because society wants to see them as negative, right? Mm. If you're going to go in and show that, yeah. you know, it you need to you need to understand it in the social context and then in the historical context and the intergenerational aspect of that. Yeah. So if you're a mother and you've experienced the exact same life as your child has experienced and then your own mother has also experienced the same right and it's an intergenerational piece you don't just all of a sudden know how to get your child out of poverty or out of crime or into college or fill out forms or do this or do that you don't learn that just by becoming a parent and you can't separate you can't separate people from their own histories when they've also grown up in poverty yeah. right but yet there's this responsibility put on parents in those communities that you talk about. It's like, ah, oh, they're drag, dragging their children up, dragged up. Yeah. Where's the parents? Where's the parents? Wow. And it's like, hang on. The yeah. parents are also the victims of a poor uh, environment for yeah. when they were growing up. Yeah. What do you think that they became parents and all of a sudden knew, knew how to access the world? Yeah. They are the same victims of the same thing that their children now are. And it's not about rearing. It's about our systems and the systems of inequality that exist so that only a few people get out. And then it's that idea of getting out. None of us want to get out of anywhere. We just want to flourish in our own community. So it's not that we're trying to escape. It's, it's, It's the environment that's not conducive of us fulfilling our own potential that we want to change. Like we love our neighbors. We love our community. We love the, the loyalty that exists, the imagination, even to be, even to be as resourceful as you have to be. Um, strange boy is a, he's, he's a rapper from Limerick and, and there's a line in one of his things that says I'm just trying to uh, trying to get out of here alive or what is it but there was a phrase that he used and I'm like you know people are just trying to get out of places alive mm. and that includes all the families that are shown on TV for entertainment right for entertainment purposes is they're literally trying to survive and trying to stay alive and yet people want to look at them as if they have no skills and tools you try and stay alive in them situations yeah. and you'll see what skills and tools you have to fucking develop yeah. to get out alive mm-hmm. <laughs> do you know what i mean 100%. and it same with criminality the same the same way you know people that get involved in drug dealing from a very young age and um, there's entrepreneurial skills there that are unmatched in any other sector mm-hmm. You know, you can you can do a raid and take a load of street off the dr- uh, drugs off the street and have a big news clip and talk about isn't it great? We've took this million amount of million euro. Doesn't actually fix anything. No. Doesn't actually fix anything in those communities. Yeah. But yet people get giddy from what? Oh, that's great! All oh, them drugs now off. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, never never mind what happens behind all of that. Yeah. And what that might mean for other people who now are attached to like money for that or owing for like it's it's not just as simple as you take something off but then what's really really goes astray in people's minds in ireland is that it's one of the most successful markets and it corrects itself very quickly yeah you're not making any dint in the drugs market in any country by taking a million euro out of someone's gaff in cannabis it just that's it's not actually doing anything there's there's these um there's a group of academics and i think at the london school of economics who've done great research and shown yeah. how um you know how drug drug busts or whatever you want to call them don't actually affect the drugs market no. and it's all an illusion then to the rest of society that isn't policing doing great we've taken all these drugs off but actually we haven't solved any of the issues that led to the fact that there's such a demand for drugs in the first place yeah. you know yeah and and when they if you look at 
when you break down them photographs or them 15 second 30 second newsreels it's a lot of blokes standing around a lot of drugs going ego if <laughs> egos look at we done yeah. aren't we great most you know of them I mean? most of them most of them love a bit of coke at a festival and they're going look what we've just and it's like ah you know i'm full body autonomy yeah. like but what's going to happen is it'll be towards the end of my life but the drug dealers will be the boys from Clongos mm. that go, okay, this is becoming kind of legal and they're going to set up the dispensaries like they do in America and the drugs will be taking our jobs down and they'll have to go and buy their drugs off the blokes from Clongos and the lads in the suits because they own the dispensaries and yeah. that's what's going to happen. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. The yeah. businessmen own all the drugs in yeah. America now. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. what's going and that's, to happen. I've had conversations about this before, even with... Um, like people that are kind of quite high up in in the cannabis industry and the marijuana industry in like um Colorado and stuff mm -hmm. and um I'd be involved with like a global team of people that are looking at like you know fair and just prosecution and um you know better policing and also I work globally then with a group of people on drug decriminalization yeah. and all those conversations and that's one thing I keep bringing up going so if we moved ever like whatever about Ireland not being there yet in terms of politically not there yet it's definitely there at a societal level yeah. but in terms of um the drug trade becoming legal and different types of people then be it's it's legal now so you're not scumbags for yeah. selling it right yeah, yeah. but then it's like can we have a conversation about all the drug dealers the skill sets that they have and um, the understanding of the market that they have and um, all the resources that they've developed in terms of their tools and skills over the years and bring them into that legalization conversation yeah do you know yeah. actually bring those drug dealers into that create an amnesty yeah where you know unless you've obviously murdered somebody right but like i mean for 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 drug dealers at that low level community level bring them in and have them as part of that legalization conversation yeah and actually have them as part of the solution and uh, of the answer do you know yeah. what i mean i remember years ago trying to set up um a, a drug dealers pilot program in, when I ran the drug services in Bluebell because a lot of drug services don't want to work with drug dealers but yet drug dealers are also drug users yeah. and it's kind of it never really made sense to me yeah. so I always try to create like innovative ways to work with drug dealers and myself and Fiona O'Reilly Dr Fiona O'Reilly carried out a piece of research um, with middle ranking drug dealers going back is I'd say more than a decade ago but there's been no research in Ireland on this right and this airs was only a small sample it was a really small piece of research but it really needs to be done right because it was their drug dealers views on exit strategies yeah so the biggest things that came out of that was so when, when what we defined as middle ranking drug dealers was they weren't dependent on a drug so okay. they weren't a heroin user dependent on a drug they didn't use drug services okay um they might have recreationally still used drugs and stuff but there was yeah so we had to define what we seen as middle ranking okay. for the sample but the biggest things that came out of that was most of them when they hit their late 20s or 30s didn't want to be selling drugs anymore okay they just they 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 wanted a way out they wanted to find a way out they wanted a legitimate way out and yeah. um, they obviously had debt to contend to they spoke about not being able to sleep not being able yeah. they they want out they're not going look at me in my range rover am i die so cool they're kind of going this is not this is not how i want to live yeah. right and none of that side of of that industry ever gets shown because we always just show the ruthlessness yeah, end yeah. of it you know yeah. where there's a whole thousands of people involved in drug dealing that yeah. have nothing got to do with crime or debt or gangs right and it's like the big one of the biggest things for them entering drug dealing was they were only 12 or 14 mm. and some of them didn't want to wear their brother's hand-me-downs anymore yeah. One of them wanted to save for weather glaze window for his ma because the corporation was putting them in at the time and he hadn't got his and it was in the 90s like you know so there was these basic needs yeah. that they were trying to meet as teenagers yeah. Yeah. you know that 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 entered them into drug dealing but none of us want to talk about why young people are in drug dealing we just want to criminalize them lock them up tell the world they're scumbags and move yeah. them on do you know what i mean yeah and not find actual answers to working with people who are involved in in crime at that level yeah yeah now it's 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 a huge thing and especially in people i know um that would be 
not involved in it, maybe out the other side, and some of them that are at risk, mm. you know. And it's basic needs like that. There mightn't be a dad around, you know, load of trauma, and the drug dealer or the group or whatever is the family unit because there's no family unit. Mm. Do you know what I mean? The mm. gang is the mm. bond, mm. you know. Plus, like, growing up, it's like, state your runners, yeah. you know. It's the new runners. Yeah. It's the new tracks. It's not yeah. Range Rovers. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's yeah. it's it's basic stuff, basic mm. needs that you mm. spoke about. Mm. You know, but it's um, I, I I'm I, I'm as I said, full body autonomy. Whatever you want to take, you should be allowed to take in this country. That's me. Um, that's the way I think. I I, I read a lot of um, Doctor Gabor Mate mm. stuff and also Johan Harry. Yeah. And I've, I've, I've read had Johan Harry over to, to me and stuff. Like yeah. I've, I've yeah. read extensively. Yes, I, I've read also about the the Swiss health minister mm. that actually opened up, and it's amazing here. You haven't heard it so much in divorce years. You know, a building in your area that's getting a bit done up, and someone goes. That's going to be used in the ejection centre or whatever for God. the junkies. And that's fucking marching in. Whereas <laughs> she opened up an injection centre directly across from our house yeah. in Switzerland. Yeah. Can you imagine a health minister having the stones to do that in this country? But you see, the thing is, right? See, the problem I'd have with that is, is there drug users, intravenously, intravenous drug users living in her community, right? Yeah. Do they live there? Is that where they hang around? So... In most cases, them arguments, I go, yeah, like, you know, I hate NIMBYism, you know, not in my backyard. But we also have to look at where the need is. Yeah. So for me, like, uh, like I just can't... If like, she lived in the city. Yeah, well then, if she's in, in the city, yeah, great. In Zurich. So it's making, I've been yeah, there, there's yeah, lots of drug use yeah, there. Yeah, you know? so it's making sure that you provide a service where the need is. Mm. And in terms of... Um, the I, I hate the and and I I would I've I I spent years getting the word the J word out of me um language yeah, yeah. but obviously that's still used yeah, in such yeah, a derogatory yeah, way yeah, against yeah. um yeah. people who 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 use drugs but yeah. in terms of the injecting centres like they just make so much sense yeah. nobody has ever in the world died in an injection no. centre we have a higher we have a higher OD rate than we have um you know road traffic accidents yeah. but yeah if you look at the investment put into trying to educate people around road traffic accidents and there's this complete absence of understanding of how many people are actually overdosing on a day we have we, i think we have the high one of the highest rates in europe yeah. of overdose in ireland yeah. and nobody has ever died of an overdose in a safe injecting yeah. facility i visited them in paris and mm -hmm. it's actually next door to maternity ward no issues it's amazing it's like pe i don't know what people have in their head about what an ejection center is like you know it's like and then this false concept that you know oh it will bring all the drug users into the area no that's why the injection center is going there because the drug users are in the area yeah. and then they'll, people will give out about drug paraphernalia on the grounds right yeah. on the ground or like we don't want drug paraphernalia you know on the way into a school or whatever and it's like yeah okay so we're trying to offer a solution for you not to have drug paraphernalia on the ground and you're against it yeah. you're against the solution so can we strip it back really here and go are you actually just discriminatory and have biases and are actually judging drug users and it's not about the safe injecting centre and it's not about the paraphernalia it's actually about the people yeah. and you just don't want them anywhere near like even even places in town that put in like local objections against a safe injecting site like fucking restaurants that just came in here set up their big fancy restaurants have nothing got to do with the community yeah. trying to stop safe injecting sites for people yeah. who are integrated into that community and part of that community yeah. and that's what I hate is that it's like you know people going we don't want this in our community we don't want that in our community and we're like drug users are your community yeah, they're, <laughs> they're not separate to you yeah. they are us this is us yeah. including that yeah. man that needs to go in there and inject heroin into his groin yeah. he is you mm -hmm. he is your community and mm -hmm. like we, we have to stop allowing people to separate out what they don't like as if they're not part of the community yeah. and that community is some sort of other entity where people are just in some little bubble and it's all very nice and it's all very flowery and that all the rest of the human complexities that we don't like are nothing got to do with us yeah. because that's us wrong we are all those things and we have this separation in this country like you use the j word like junkies i know people like that and years ago listen to me you know doing bleeding lines in the jacks all night and then 
Lady Joke. He's looking at the it's, it's like, no, you are one. You're just high <laughs> end. You can afford a higher. Yeah. It goes in your nose, that goes in his groin. Yeah. You are one of the same. Yeah. But, but It's a hierarchy. People create hierarchies hmm. because I think on a really human level, we need to be not that. Yeah. I know I'm bad, but I'm not that. Yes. So we keep creating hierarchies mm. and hierarchies, even if we're engaging in similar behaviour, we'll try and find a way that we're not we're not as we're not that, you know what I mean? And I think mm. that's what we do a lot in this country and it's the same, you know, it's the same even with like, you know, ostracizing different communities. It's the same with the traveller community. I think as as people we need to be working much more closely together yeah. because ultimately we are all in this together yeah. and then there's a whole other portion of society that's making decisions about how we live yeah. and then we're all in a smaller space killing each other when yeah. we're actually the fucking same people. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But also fr from take a motion now because once injection centers and you mention that word, people like th their backs get up emotion. Me and you, we want to use heroin here, right? Both of us overdose. Somebody rings an ambulance for us, right? The ambulance, 500 euros. We get brought to hospital then. There's another couple of hundred euros. So from a financial point of view, that's just two people. That may happen 14, 15 mm. times in any given day. Mm. It makes financial mm. sense. Mm. Take the emotion out of it. It's financial yeah, sense. Yeah. And no one is dying. Yeah. And then somebody... Who, who is like I want to stop yeah, I want to stop here well we go counselling like, you know? here this yeah. counselling mm. it might take a couple of months or mm. it's it just makes financial sense and from to get somebody clean sober and out the other side yeah. or some people want to use heroin fine but yeah. I like Johan Harry that he spoke about in Switzerland they gave them an option of you can keep up in your dose as much as you want and they found it's like a, it when Yvonne brings sweets into my house, right? If they're all there, I have to eat them. You know what I mean? Yeah. But eventually, if they're everywhere, they haven't got that appeal anymore. No, no. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And he yeah. found with the, the data that he looked at, the more it's like how much do you want to use? You can use any amount. No one's dying. But what that openness did was people start reducing and start coming off. So... If we use this this system that we've used for 20, 30 years, you only have to go into town at the moment. I've never seen so many addicts mm. ever. It's not getting it's not getting better. So what we're doing is not yeah. working. Yeah, no, prohibition hasn't worked, and it's not working. And it's like people are still standing behind prohibition again. And then you have to ask: so is it really that you don't believe that you believe in prohibition, or do you just actually again have an issue? with people who don't look or sound like mm. you or have a different drug use um, different type of drug use than you yeah. do you know what I mean and like there's this thing like like obviously drug use is in every estate and it's in every society and it's in every you know and but there's a difference between drug abuse and drug use so not everybody needs support and health not everyone needs a health intervention yeah. not everyone needs a counsellor just because they use drugs yeah. it's only when we we have to separate that out because there's there's m the percentage is way way higher of people that just use drugs and will never have an issue yeah. and then the other aspect then is the drug abuse and the chaoticness and the chaotic nature of that drug abuse and usually they are the, the people that are the most traumatised that need the most support mm. and the most care yeah. but yet we don't want to actually provide the space for them to do that and the safe injecting facility is just one example of where we're trying to you know exclude people from the care that they need yeah. you know yeah. But yet we'll have pubs everywhere, yeah. and you'll be slumped in a corner, fucking vomit all over you, yeah. and we'll just go, oh look at him, and yeah, you mentioned a heroin user with, um, like, and an ejecting centre, and it's like, Jesus Christ, yeah, they're gonna be pulling kids out of schools, banging it into their yeah. arms, and yeah. the like, demonisation of yeah. people yeah. for yeah. no other reason than bias and yeah. discriminatory thought processes, you know, yeah. and caring too much about what other people are doing, yeah. like stop caring about what other people are doing and just fucking focus on yourself like yeah no no Lynn thanks a million for doing the podcast you're welcome thank you so much really enjoyed that conversation please like share subscribe this podcast give Lynn a follow and uh, you up the telemots <laughs> <laughs>